Today we have with us uh, Tom Diger, who writes as Thomas Diger. Tom is a native Chicagoan who moved to New York City in 1980 and has not left since. He started off writing about his native land, the third coast, when Chicago built the American dream. He's written three novels. But now he has written this mammoth and excellent book, which I truly recommend. I think I'm holding up the proof copy, but you get the idea. New York, New York, New York. I'm going to ask him to explain that title, which is one of my favorite things about the book in a moment. Tom is also a totally out of control sports fan and I'm not gonna let him go there. Uh, we're going to be very disciplined, Tom. We're gonna to stick to the subject of our talk, which is New York. Tom, welcome. Tell us, when you came to New York in 1980, what kind of city did you find? Uh, a dirty, scary, dangerous, absolutely fabulous, thrilling, exciting place. You know, it was, I was going to college, so I was 18. The drinking age in New York was 18. It was the beginning of hip hop in the downtown scene. Uh, Reagan was president, so you had this kind of bursting forth. I worked at a bookstore on the Upper East Side, so you had kind of high society and old rich New York bursting forth. It was all kind of happening. And under Koch, the mayor, Ed Koch, um, the city was pulling itself painfully out of the fiscal crisis that you know, was the city that people think of that, that image of uh, taxi driver and escape from New York and all that kind of dismal dystopic vision of what New York was, it was kind of pulling itself out of that, but it was um, a mess. It was hard to live in and it was great fun to live in. Uh, it was a very complicated place full of meaning and full of peril. But what was great for an 18 year old in college was not necessarily great for trying to raise a family there, trying to build a solid tax base, things like that. So it's when you look back with nostalgia, like I do, you know, and even talking about this, I'm like, oh, you know, with Soho at one o'clock in the morning and I'm smoking, you know, I was smoking then, which was wonderful. Um, you know, that's not exactly what the city maybe needed to be in a generative sense. So the story of the book is really that arc um, of that wonderful, terrible moment of the city to when I started to write it, which was 2013, when Michael Bloomberg was finishing his term as, as mayor, his three terms as mayor, and what the city had become, which was kind of static free, much better place to live in in a certain way, um, safer, cleaner, bigger, smarter, but also um, much less about that kind of ugly, messy wonderfulness that created so many good things. That's my long answer. We're going to come back to the yeah. city of today, which you describe as the luxury city. Right. But just very briefly, how did New York get into that mess that you encountered age 18? What were the forces that had right. kind of made it messy and dirty and dangerous? Right. Well, in the, you know, in the most basic kind of financial ways, um, the, the, the financial crisis, the fiscal crisis in, in the mid 70s was a product of, of the city borrowing, frankly, too much money under Nelson Rockefeller, the governor, um, who was a kind of, we'd say now a liberal Republican, and under a succession of uh, Democratic mayors, the city got into a place, and the state both, got into a place of just really starting to try to mint money almost, where they were borrowing money to pay down interest. You know, it, it, the city did find itself in a bad fiscal place, but at the same time, there was, um, it would have gotten out of it. But the politics of the moment, you know, late post oil crisis, stagflation, and all the other things that were going on in the 70s, kind of economically and world politically, there was a definite drive by and also kind of post 60s era of big pocket democratic support of cities that this was a moment for um, basically moneyed interest Republican pushback against that, that here was a great example of um, a case to be made. We're going to pull out New York and say, you know what, we're not going to, you're going to have to get your act in order. And we're not just going to keep putting out money, paying money to, um, you know, urban interests, minorities, you know, the kind of unspoken word here. Um, and so it became a test case, really, for banks to say, no, we're not going to keep lending you money. You're going to have to get yourself in order. But most importantly, kind of rejigger your priorities. It's not now about taking, you know, schools, all these other things that they call redistribution of wealth that many people would call basic services of a civil society were now considered kind of secondary and the job of the city was to bring in money. Its job is to 
yeah. you know, it, it, another version of, of trickle down. Its job is to attract capital and how it gets distributed is sort of up to everybody in the city. And in the 80s, you know, amidst all the violence and the crack ep epidemic, New York does start to attract capital. Yeah. So what starts to happen? What are the changes that drive this transformation in, in the 80s? Well, I mean, there are all these other, there are other elements that kind of created that sense of, of cultural and social elements that created that sense of every man for himself in New York, you know, of, of crime and a sort of pushback that had been going on for a long time about leaving the city's wife flight um, on a social level, the city was kind of every man for himself. So those things kind of came together in the pulling out of that, of, of conscious sense of trying to bring people back into the city, people who would come back and become homeowners and actually add tax revenue, um, which kicked off a whole other wave of social and demographic change involving minorities and kind of gentrification as we can talk about. But um, on a kind of capital and money level, the city had been battling with London um, for kind of regaining its um, financial dominance. You know, part of the story is New York losing its position or getting kind of shaky in the 70s as to where it stood as the global economy kind of took different forms. And so as Reagan and the, the US government sort of changes, um, loosens up the markets, uh, Volcker lets interest rates float. I mean, a lot of things stir interest again, and, and the markets are unleashed basically in Wall Street, and that starts to throw off um, just huge amounts of money, you know, which kind of meets also, to me, generational change. You know, you've got baby boomers. You know, I never really considered myself a yuppie, but I have to admit that, you know, I, I guess I was one. Um, you know, that was a generation that had gone through the 60s, had gone through Vietnam, um, the oil crisis, uh, you know, the, the uh, stagflation, all these other things that had just calcified the economy. And so they're interesting, you know, when the market takes off in 82 or so, just a couple of weeks before that, there was a fascinating article, very interesting one in, in New York Magazine, that was just bemoaning how the baby boomers were the first generation that seemed that they wouldn't do as well as their parents. Yeah. You know, that, that was like, there was just no sense. It was all going downhill for them. And so when the market takes off and when it, you know, it's not just like, this is what the future is. It was like, this is the last lifeboat to get into if you want to retire somewhere, you know, where they're going to change your bedpan. I mean, it was like a desperation almost. And so there was not just kind of the, the, the kind of objective movement of the market, but there was a social push to it. There was a kind of rush into it by a young generation of people who moved back into the city and began to make a huge amount of money in it. And that really changed the city in enormous amount of good and bad in social and cultural ways as well. So you get the bankers moving in, the kind of story of Bonfire of the Vanities, but you also get what Richard Florida calls the creative class deciding that New York is a really good place to live. How does that, or how would you see that change? Right. I mean, I think that, you know, when Florida talks about that, I think that's much, I think that's a bit further down the line. I mean, I think one of the original impacts is that what we would call the creative class of the 60s and 70s actually gets kind of moved around. You know, I mean, they, they kind of start the movement with artists um, creating places fundamentally like Soho. I mean, their presence in the 70s is what makes Soho happen, which was originally going to be just plowed under as part of a big expressway, Robert Moses, who many have heard of, you know, the power broker who kind of re, just redraws the map of New York for decades, right? One of his last things he wants to do is to build this expressway across lower Manhattan that would have just destroyed all of what is Soho. So between Jane Jacobs, a lot of, of public movement and Moses is losing steam as a power in the city that ends up being blocked. But all that time, all these warehouses and small factories that are in what we now know of the Soho below Houston Street in New York are left empty because the owners feel that it's going, they're gonna get their eminent domain check. And so whatever, let some artists move in there, that'll be fine, you know? And when it doesn't happen, that artist lifestyle that started to grow there, that people have started to come to and enjoy small shops, the kind of a, it's a different experience of the city that suddenly becomes I don't want to say codified, but commodified. It seems like that's a good idea. And suddenly those landowners say, you know, this is kind of great. Um, 
we're going to sell these apartments and we're going to sell these lofts, you know, with the exposed brick and all that kind of thing that was very tasty in the 70s and 80s. And that's going to be a lifestyle. And so the artists end up getting pushed out of this world. They can't afford to live there. And that movement of where artists are going to go next ends up being um, an interesting way of tracing where, because where they go, that interest in lifestyle kind of follows. And so they didn't so much necessarily all come flying in. It's watching their kind of domestic migration through the city um, that, that kind of leads the way, I think. Um, later on, I think there's a, another generation that, that, that Richard Florida talks about that is, I think, a broader understanding of those people that is more tech-based. I mean, that's just the way I yeah, tend to see and, it. And kind of, of people like graphic designers yeah, and I mean, the, advertising people. The, yeah. post, the kind of post-cyber boom generation, I mean, the 90s, I think that's a slightly different crew. So this battle between Robert Moses, who wants the expressway, and Jane Jacobs, who wants to preserve the beautiful old neighborhoods with really quite low build buildings like Gren her native Greenwich Village or her adopted Greenwich Village, that really is crucial because that means that New York becomes a city with density and neighborhoods and really quite small local streets, you know, com the converse of the skyscraper, which most American cities don't offer. So is that a huge part of the secret of the kind of success of the city the next 30, 40 years. It is, but it also has the seeds of some real serious problems. Um, you know, as much as, as a, really on the, when it comes to Moses, it's a fascinating book by Marshall Berman. I don't know if you ever read it, all that, all that, uh, God, I can't, sorry, that flipped out of my mind. Marxist philosopher, but a brilliant guy who really talks, looks at Moses in terms of, of modernism and density and the fact that what he's doing is actually something that a lot of people have wanted is creating more space, more, you know, more housing, uh, different ways of, of kind of expanding the city and modernizing the city. And Jacobs has her own drawbacks and that that kind of sense of, of, of community control, low density kind of thing is one of the ideas that leads to um, or helps build gentrification. Um, it's a double-edged sword. You know, if you have all these wonderful low density buildings that create the street ballet, you're also um, stopping time. You are not really uh, letting the city adjust to the greater needs of, of more density. And so not allowing those, more housing to be built. Exactly. So, you know, it raises market prices. You can go into a neighborhood like Park Slope and, and buy your beat up, you know, building and redo it with all your sweat equity and, and become a part of that neighborhood. But um, it, it is literally gentrifying a neighborhood. So um, those terms mean something different in the 70s than they do when they're kind of corporatized in the 20 in the 21st century, where it's much more consciously done and not just people kind of finding a stake in there and, and rebuilding. But so I think when you look at that Jacobs and Moses dialectic, um, it's important to see both sides. And then later under Bloomberg, they kind of pick up that mantle and try to blend the two with Dan Doctoroff, who is uh, a deputy mayor who's kind of the big uh, the big picture guy. He wants to redo the city. They do a huge wave of, of different kinds of zonings around the city. And ostensibly, it's going to be balanced by Amanda Burden, who is someone who grew up uh, uh, under, you know, studying with Holly White, great urbanist who we can talk about later, who's kind of the godfather, a lot of the really good ideas that come out of it. And she's head of city planning and has a much more Jacobs-like street level understanding. And so Bloomberg the theory is that those two people are going to work together against and with each other to create a different way of looking at the city. It's going to blend that Moses power with a kind of Jacob sensitivity to community. That's one, of the things I, works. <laughs> that's one of the things I really like about your book is these stories of individuals whose names are not necessarily famous, but who made a small difference. Because right. that's a lot of the story of New York is people just, as Jane Jacobs did, just getting up and saying, hey, I like this or I don't like this and I'm going to get involved. Could you talk about in that context about Central Park, which I found a very sure. interesting story, how that went from no-go area to this kind of splendor? Right. I mean, you know, as we talk about that, when you led me off talking about New York as being such a kind of blasted hellscape, you know, a lot of that was about public space and public space and the parks especially were at that point a kind of free place. You did what you wanted and to hell with everyone else, basically. That was a sense of public space in New York. And Koch's um, Parks Commissioner was a, a guy named Gordon Davis. 
who uh, his thought was really to go back to Frederick Law Olmsted and his vision of parks. He was the guy who built Central Park. Right, right the, the great uh, landscape architect, among other things. And to, who looked at public parks as, as where we express democracy. You know, it is a shared space, not free space. It's shared space with certain expected behaviors that we can have of each other that we express what you want to do, you kind of add your own voice to the to the party next to each other and we do this thing together. And so Davis through a number of relatively small policies, but instead of just letting people do what they want in the park, he brings in a group of urban park rangers who have, you know, kind of national park ranger hats like Spokey the Bear and are there ostensibly just to kind of set rules and say, no, we don't just throw our garbage wherever we're going to, this is, you kind of act in certain ways. And he's able to get some concessions for unions. And uh, I think the best story about him was early on in his work when he goes up to uh, a park up in Northern Manhattan and there's baskets full of garbage, just heaps of, you know, garbage. And there are guys sitting there in lawn chairs, feet up kind of, you know, enjoying the spring sunshine. And he asked, Gordon Davis asked the supervisor, like, what's going on? And the guy goes, you know, there's this fiscal crisis and we just can't do anything, you know? And so to Davis, this a light goes off and he's like, you know, actually we can, there is a level of accountability that A, it's your job to pick this stuff up, but a lot of New Yorkers in government and out had been using the fiscal crisis as sort of an excuse to not do, to not participate, to kind of not actively engage the city as a uh, you know, shared space as a whole. And so by adding accountability to how parks worked, it was the beginning. And so Central Park itself becomes to him this vast kind of place to really work this out. And he could spend his whole job on that. So he brings in Betsy Barlow Rogers. There's been other foundations that have been working with George Soros and Richard Gilder together fund the organization that- There's a lot of money. Know, it, right, is a lot of money and from two very different places, which is kind of fascinating, but um, come together. And so she is in charge then of really rethinking Central Park and turning it, not restoring it to what it had been in the 19th century, but to rethinking it for now and turning it into a place that um, New Yorkers can use and also use actively as opposed to just kind of using that tragedy of common sense. It's a place you go and participate in. And I think that ended up becoming a model in certain ways. Central Park Zoo, right? the, the, the zoo in New York um, is another place that had been just left to seed. And um, uh, Davis works out a deal with the New York Zoological Society that runs the Bronx Zoo to bring in people who actually know how to run a zoo. And so it's also kind of the, one of the first steps towards engaging public private partnerships in the city in a much more active way. Just on Central Park, because it is a very interesting model for what happens to the city. Central Park is a sort of byword for crime. You know, you can't walk across the park. Uh, the uh, Central Park um, rape of 1991, in which Donald Trump gets very vocally involved. Right. Or I think it was 1991 around then. 89. But, but, 89, but, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Almost right. Is a kind of um, symbolic moment for the city. And then in the years after that, that sort of doesn't disappear, but it hugely declines. Now, you have a very interesting, subtle, nuanced take on why crime goes in New York, goes down. Can you tell us something about that? Well, I think, you know, one of the pieces certainly with Central Park is about perception. Um, crime was never as bad in Central Park as everybody made it out to be, but it seemed like a very, very scary place. Crime in the subways was never as bad as it seemed to be, but it, it was part of the job of, of turning back crime was convincing people that some of these places weren't as bad as they thought they were. But crime in general in New York was um, already going down under Dinkins, um, who came in in 1990, was elected in 89. And really from the beginning, the moment he walks in, crime already starts to go down every quarter of four years in office. Um, but it, the perception of it is terrible. It's peak crack. Um, and crack was a particularly devastating kind of, of drug in the city because it was a, a kind of every man's drug. It was a lot cheaper to, to sell and one didn't need the kind of complicated distribution systems you needed to have if you were selling huge amounts of, of heroin or something like that. So 
um, it was a very Reagan-esque drug. You know, it was great for entrepreneurs. It was a way to make a little money. And so it wasn't controlled. And that meant that it created these kinds of crazy Wild West situations. And so by the time you get to Dinkins, um, a lot of that has just, it burns through the, the network of, of uh, people who are, are selling drugs and using them changes. The, uh, the ethos, uh, kids have watched their families just be destroyed, their parents, aunts and uncles, kind of the, the whole structure of many neighborhoods that had been of hit by crack were flipped upside down and kids ended up being in charge. So they watched that and they didn't want to use crack. They sold crack. If you listen to gangster rap, it's about selling crack. It's not about using it. I mean, so there are many, many threads that go into why crime started to go down. I would say housing was one of them. Under Koch, a big housing initiative starts that adds hundreds of thousands of units to the city and places in the imagination that we have of the South Bronx being this blasted you know, acres and acres of rubble. By the time, you know, we get to the early 90s, most of those places now have houses. There's buildings on them. There's all kinds of different kinds of housing that have been added. So places that were terrific for dealing drugs um, now become neighborhoods, you know, with houses that uh, have kitchens in front on purpose so people can look out the windows and see what's happening on the street. So all these things are pushing to crime, which then meet a more aggressive kind of policing under Bill Bratton. Yeah, supported uh, by well, I want to come to the policing and the mayors in a moment, but I mean, we should also note that the fall in crime is national and indeed yeah, across the West exactly. and very convincing explanations. It might have to do with people playing video games. The people who used to commit crimes are now in their bedroom. There's that. There are crimes. other, you know, there's and a lead, very... The lead taken out of the water. The lead, the lead paint, well, it's lead paint. I mean, because that was, and but also um, legalized abortion. There's a lot of evidence and numbers that kind of go towards that. There's a, a many, many, many kind of causes that Giuliani really takes as my police ended crime. And, you know, I would also add the crime bill in 94. If you're going to solve gun crime, you need some national, you need better gun control laws. And so that, that also is a piece of it. If we're looking at rising gun crime in the United States and we don't have any national gun laws, I, I, I think we need to start at the top for some of that as well. Okay, so let, let's get to Giuliani. The city is already improving, already becoming much safer. Then he comes in and he starts this very tough and quite racialized policing. How do we look, how do you look back on that era? Well, what, I mean, a couple of thoughts on that. One is that the perception under Dinkins, I mean, even though the numbers see, are, are getting better and so many things in the city are getting better, he's really not able to express that. And very few people, I mean, I'm going to say, honestly, having been there, no one felt it was getting better. It was sold as still in great crisis when Giuliani comes in and financially it was still in a, in a somewhat tricky spot, but everything was really getting better. So Giuliani sold himself as the, the solution. Um, but it, it, in the sense of, of policing, you know, the person who really is behind it is, is Bill Bratton, um, who's able to, who's a Democrat. And so as much as it is racialized and Giuliani is running as a kind of fusion Republican, um, Bratton has a certain amount of cover. He's, the press loves him. He's not, um, he's not one of Giuliani's guys, he's someone else. So- The tough working class Bostonian. Right, so he, and he does two things and only one of, part of it's what happens on the street, but a lot of it has to do with, with one police plaza, with the police department itself, which is maybe the most kind of sclerotic, you know, tradition stuck agency within the whole city at this point. And there's been a long time fear of corruption uh, information is very siloed. There's huge amounts of hierarchy. Police, street police are still operating under, I mean, if you remember Serpico in the 70s, that sense of just endemic corruption, the greatest fear of the New York Police Department at this point is corruption of their police actually interacting with other people on the street than actually solving crime or preventing crime in any way. So one of the things that Bratton does, he was transit police head, and he's got a chip on his shoulder about the police department because till this point, the police have looked at the transit police as kind of the losers, the guys who didn't get into the police department. So he comes in and really cleans house. He sets standards of here's what's gonna happen. He brings in metrics, breaks down silos of information and, and kind of levels hierarchies and 
devolves power much more to individual precincts and, and to cops. So street cops can now make arrests that they were not allowed to make before that. So kind of the whole power structure of how the police work to activate them is on a very objective level, not a bad thing. It's actually kind of re-energizing the police to try to do the things they're supposed to do, which is serve and protect. Um, and analytics data comes into this. Up to this point, they're getting, put, they're getting crime statistics annually, which is hard to do much with getting crime statistics in a city of eight, you know, seven and a half million people annually. So a guy who we worked with, Jack Maple, begins to make this drive for data, data, what's happening this month? And then it becomes this week. And they start to bring in um, the officers and the, the sergeants and the precinct people. And they end up creating this thing called Comstat, which is a weekly meeting where um, the, the, the statistics are gone through. Each precinct captain is brought in and they look at the maps of where crimes are happening. What yeah, and that's crimes? crucial. So in if it's at this corner, then we're going to control this corner. Right, exactly. And, and, you know, this kind of work has been done before. Sanitation was doing in the 80s. So it's not as if the police department invents it. They're so far behind that they actually grab new technology and they kind of look like they've invented this stuff. But that kind of close analytics have been going on. But they now do it in this way that's super visible and, and much more ramped up. And so Comstep becomes almost a, a, a rival to what Giuliani used to have an eight o'clock meeting every morning. It was kind of leadership meeting. And so uh, Bratton starts to have the meeting at seven to like get in there before. He's up before Giuliani. There's this kind of rivalry because the city loves Bratton. The numbers go down precipitously. Um, and I remember waking up, you know, being out when not waking up, but being out one night at, you know, two in the morning and walking around thinking, you know, oh my God, it's two in the morning. And I'm not like, what street am I going to? Is there, is there a deli ahead that I can get to that light? I mean, it used to be a very, people had a real map of where you were going, what streets were safe. And suddenly there was this freedom, which was terrific. The problem is that the kind of hard policing, um, the using of, of you know, broken windows, which was, a, I think, a misused or kind of misunderstood term at this point, um, to be able to, you know, the way that you can get pulled over for a broken headlight, right, or a broken taillight, and they can check and see if you have any warrants on you. The idea was, if you jump over a turnstile, if you break a kind of one of the new laws that are around public space, that you get pulled over for that and kind of we go through your warrants then and find things that, that are happening. It's used as an excuse. It's not that making an area nicer or fixing the broken windows gets rid of criminals. It's that it's used as a pretext to bring people over. And that is the core of an idea that then really metastasizes, and I think there's no better word for it, into stop and frisk of just hauling hundreds of thousands of people of color over of all income level and just willy nilly um, and, and used as a pretext for just kind of occupying minority New York and subjugating them. So which Bloomberg then continues, you know, Bloomberg continues um, in a way that I think not consciously I wanted to, you know, I don't think he ever sat down and said, we must do that. Bloomberg believed in experts and he brought in people who he felt were the best people and said, all right, you're in charge and don't screw it up and really trusted them to do their job. In many cases, they did that. He gave, I think, an enormous amount of power to Ray Kelly, who was his, um, who was kind of a rival to Bratton and I think had a lot to prove. Um, it kind of that, that he was the native born, he was, you know, Bratton was raised up, as you mentioned, in Boston. He was kind of the golden boy of the Boston Police Department who came to New York. And Ray Kelly was the golden boy of the NYPD. And Giuliani passed over him. So when he comes in under Bloomberg, he's got a lot to prove. Mm -hmm. And after 9-11, he is given the wherewithal to create things under the New York Police Department that no other police department, certainly the United States have. I mean, it has its own counterterrorism unit, its own spies around the world, its own intelligence in other countries. It's crazy. I mean, at a certain point, even the FBI will mm -hmm. not take information that the New York Police Department develops because they don't think it'll stand up in court. I mean, the terrorism created this enormous blanket of cover for the police to go really far. And that, and so stop and frisk was just kind of, all right, that's, you know, the enemies were the bad guys out there in the rest of the world, the terrorists, what happened domestically, people kind of turned their, you know, blind eye to.
I'm going to come to 9-11 and the financial crisis in a moment. Just one last word on the police. People are asking about the TV series NYPD. A very quick comment on that. NY, which, which... NYPD TV series? I am not a watcher of it. Um, I'm trying to think of what series that is. I'm, uh, I'm, I guess you're not a big TV watcher. Let's pivot. I'm not, no, it's, I'm sorry. It's just, I, I apologize. It's not, I, is it, I mean, I know Chicago PD, but I'm not... Um, you know, the, listen. The great, the great police series is The Wire, and that's Baltimore. You're gonna have to get David. Si oh, NYPD no, Blue. NYPD Blue. <sighs> you're, you're not a TV man. It's fine. The best. Sorry, people. I'm sorry uh, on that. We, okay, I we're moving into television, television, but that's not one of mine. We're moving into the 21st century. New York, within seven years, has two enormous crises, catastrophes. 9-11, and then on a very different kind of level, the financial crisis, epicenter right. of which the global financial crisis is Wall Street. Now, on the day, in the month, these are, you know, especially 9-11 is a tragedy. The long term, my sense from your book, is they don't really slow down New York. Why is that? How do these crises impact the city or not? Well, I mean, 9-11 was psychologically devastating. I mean, it, it, but its actual practical impact was, um, you know, limited to that area. Um, it was an enormous gouge in the soul in a certain way. And I think its worst impact was what we were talking about before, this sense of, of a free ticket to deal with terrorism, a free ticket to kind of do whatever had to happen to get rid of terrorism, which was incredibly devastating. But the idea that no one's ever going to live in a tall building again, um, that no one is going to want to live in Manhattan because it's going to be so dangerous. It helped fuel interest in Brooklyn. It was certainly one of the things that sent people over the East River and really exploring that area, which was already filling up with artists that already had golden ages many times, you know, of, of kind of Bohemia. But now it became more and more uh, a middle class place to live. So. Uh, that was its impact, but within a couple of years, things are going pretty well, even with Ground Zero being a complete mess, um, you know, run by the state very poorly, uh, just the kind of mismanagement of the redevelopment and rebuilding in that area, which there are still parts that need to be built that are still kind of in play. Um, that was not good, but the markets, you didn't have to be in a pit anymore. A lot of the basic functions that the financial district served not having the World Trade Center there was not devastating. It opened up development there. So Bloomberg also took that kind of sense of unity around that moment, and which people absolutely wanted. Um, the period right after 9-11, if you were in the city, was, I, I hesitate um, to call it magical, but it was remarkable. Rebecca Solnit calls it a, the, like a disaster paradise that happened, or disaster utopia, sorry, um, after these kinds of events happened where people just drop um, their armor, you know, and being in New York then was a remarkable experience. And people were very willing to let Bloomberg come up with new ideas and really bring us together and move forward. When we talk about the luxury city, it was a sort of odd misquote, a speech he gives at the end of his first year when he talks about corporations and in trying to make the city into a place where the best and the brightest of the world want to come and be a part of it, which um, is not a bad idea, which is a pretty good motivation for a city to have it be a place where people come to, the best people come to. Um, but that sadly kind of conjured way too many Fendi purses and you know that kind of life of luxury of oligarchs coming in and it starts to manifest very poisonous things through that era in the sense of, of luxury real estate and just the sense of giving the city over to capital, which at a certain point, once it's refound its feet, you know, we keep doubling down into it. And I think a lot of people, a lot of average New Yorkers start to feel that the city's being taken away from them and handed over to other interests. Yeah, one vignette in your book is some astonishing number of um, homes on the Upper East Side are not inhabited for 10 months of the year. Right. It's, it, there's, and, and that's still, you know, obviously the last year recalibrates all those numbers because, it, you know, occupancy is just crazy. The, the, the real example, I think the one that's a poke in the eye to, to most New Yorkers are the super tall uh, buildings along 57th Street, you know, which are these apartments that go for, you know, upwards tens of millions of dollars, closing up to a hundred million dollars. Um, 
you know, that are owned by shell companies that are that have no um, relation really to anything that most New Yorkers consider housing or anything that's, in, you know, integrated into what city life really is. And in the middle of this development of the luxury city, which um, Bloomberg is quite keen on in many ways, the financial crisis happens. And it seems to me it happens, starts on Wall Street, but it has a bigger impact on Greece than it does on New York. How can it be that the city escapes largely unscathed? Well, it didn't. I mean, it didn't. The rich people did pretty darn well. Um, they got out of it. They got their bailout money. And one of the, um, one of, I think, the drawbacks of one of, you know, Bloomberg's checks against him was that he was not able to get to understand the impact this was having on average New Yorkers. He was very concerned that, you know, Wall Street, the brokers, the bankers, that they got taken care of. But a lot of the impact that was happening, you had huge immigrant populations, people who had bought homes over these 30 years or so, who had had mortgages, small owners. And just to keep up over the years, um, they had built equity in their homes. And in these kinds of years of, of crazy financial products, they were taking out equity in their homes, um, homes that they had paid money for just to kind of keep their heads above water. And suddenly when the housing crisis happens, which is a national thing, its impact um, on New York, the deepest impact is on people of color who have billions of dollars of capital wiped off. People who own their homes suddenly lose their homes. But you know, it's, it's, you know, and so- I very quickly recover. Yeah, I mean, well, but those neighborhoods are still, you know, I wouldn't say that they have profoundly recovered. I mean, you know, they are not blasted rubble, you know, the way we think of in the 70s or something, but that's a huge amount of, of, of capital that could, that was taken out of the hands of people who need to be able to build that interest again. So, I mean, the city has survived, but the, the idea that Wall Street did fine coming out of it, but a lot of average New Yorkers did not do fine. And listen, that's what the pandemic showed us. We did not, it did not all get better after that. What I find quite stunning about New York, about this city that's kind of swimming in wealth is how poor most people in New York are because homes are so expensive. People are really, about half the population is sort of living on the brink, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, about, about 40%. I mean, it's, you know, one of the things that was interesting to me was, you know, looking at numbers over time and being able to track certain things over time. And one of the statistics that was surprising to me was poverty through this whole period, extreme poverty is in this bandwidth between 16 and 21%, something roughly that. I mean, don't quote me on that, but it's in that ball game. And then by the time we're at Bloomberg, there's another at least 20% who are at risk of poverty, like high risk of poverty, who are basically week to week. So you're, you're right. I mean, it is about 40%. Now you could say, and I think it's true that, you know, people don't come to New York to be poor. So, you know, when you've had a, a city that has gotten, has had such an immigrant experience over these years, I mean, more than 3 million immigrants come through the city and live here for some time, about 1.5 million of them actually stay and become residents. So most of the increase in the city's population is immigrants. Um, they are certainly the most vulnerable to being in poverty and who cycles in and out of poverty is the interesting thing. But it, it goes to question whether there is, you're never going to have zero poverty in a city. I don't think that's ever existed. And in New York, it's not going to happen. But what's really, um, you know, what's most important to look at to me is the gross number. If you've added 1.5 million people, that 20% has suddenly become hundreds and thousands of more people, more families that are in distress in a city that does not have more land, that's not building enough housing for it, you know. So, the, the ability to handle that poverty is um, incredible. Most of the poverty you're not looking at, you know? I mean, if you come to visit New York, you are probably not going to areas where um, you're gonna see much of it. We have a clarifying question from Alan yeah. Taz, three million immigrants over what period? Oh, sort of, I mean, over the arc of the book, I mean, really going from the mid seventies or so through, you know, immigration starts to dip by even like 2010 or so. So, I mean, like the 35 to 40 years or so that we're talking about through the book. Um, my hometown, if I have one, London, the immigrant story is that people arrive in the East End 
And then each immigrant group successively leaves the East End. They kind of promote themselves and go to the suburbs. And so the poorest people tend to be the most recently arrived immigrants. Is the New York immigrant story comparable? I mean, to a, to a degree, I think there are many more landing places throughout the city, um, which is one of the ways that the city culturally changes. One of the things I wanted to push back with, with this book was that sense of, of you know, the city's soul was somehow vanishing. And, you know, what I kind of mentioned at the beginning, yes, that texture kind of thing. But, you know, the fact is, that's the texture I remember. That is a very Western centered kind of understanding of the city. And one of the things that happens in these years is um, that that gets knocked off, that multiculturalism and, and decentering of those things happens culturally. And so, so many of these other cultures from around the world are added to the city in to a degree that you haven't seen since maybe the turn of the century when you had the great Eastern European, you know, kind of European immigration to this city that adds Poles and Germans and all, you know, those kinds of populations to the great, you know, kind of Eastern Jewish populations. And so the city profoundly changes, it changes what it means to be a New Yorker, which is not just um, what it had been in 1968. I'm going to come to audience questions in a moment. So anyone who wants to post, uh, please do so. I'll take as many as I can. Just to sum up for me, I was very impressed by the nuanced conclusion of your book. I mean, as you were hinting just now, you don't say, oh, this luxury city is a disaster, nor do you say, oh, it's wonderful that we've left the past behind. You kind of see both sides of this. Well, how can you not? It's a very organic place. I mean, to me, cities are, are like swamps and New York is the swampiest, you know, in, in the most wonderful way. It has regular tides of things coming in and out of people bringing things into it and people leaving and taking them out to the rest of the world. So change is a real constant and trying to tell the story um, in, in terms of good guys and bad guys. Uh, the frustration I, I have felt that listening to a discourse that kind of puts people into one category or another um, and when I started it, I, I couldn't really do that. When you really look at the history to try to assign people to one side or another, the city doesn't work like that. It's a much more organic place. People are much more interested, willing, and, and have to create different kinds of networks and alliances to get things done. And it makes easy definitions hard to do. So that's why there's no, you know, the, the subtitle is Four Decades of Success, Excess, and Transformation. It's not the triumph of the city or the failure of the city. I mean, it's, I, I, I definitely intend to be a lot more nuanced because if you've lived here through that time, the experience for most people has been more nuanced than that. We're now coming to a fork in the road with cities. I mean, all these cities, this is a moment they can reinvent themselves. They are reinventing themselves as COVID we hope comes to an end. And we have questions about the future from Henry Druckerman and Chris Quigg. So what's the future of New York and what do you think is the most pressing challenge, the most inviting opportunity for the next mayor? What, what should New York do? Should is, a, should is the operative word. I mean, I've been asked to make all kinds of predictions. I don't know, no one knows, but I think right now should is the good question. And, and I do think housing is the leader here. Um, you know, we've just continually doubled and tripled down over the many crises that have happened in New York over the course of this book on the same model of what housing needs to look like, which was honestly a more recent development than people understand. You know, the city's full of massive co-op developments that were built by, with public money, public-private developments that were built by the unions that were all affordable, um, low-income housing, that were all kinds of other ways of living in the city. And so I think that we need to look and start with housing to be able to attract new people here um, to able, you know, my kids are in their 20s and they look around and they say, am I going to be able to afford to live in New York, the city I grew up in? Where are you going to build this housing? Where should they build it? Where should, well, listen, things are turning, you know, though space is small, you're looking at Gowanus um, is an area that will be turned over. I think the question of Density and zoning is always a part, and it's very much a discussion now. I think there's a, a side that looks at density as a, as a cure-all, and I don't think that's going, I don't think it is. I mean, we talked about that at the beginning. Not every place is great for density, and I think there have to be different kinds of ways to live in the city. Um, but, you know, space is always a premium, but at the same time, there are always big developments going on. And we're also looking at 
other ways that we reuse buildings. I mean, nobody would ever have thought 30 years ago that you'd be raising kids in the financial district, but people yeah, are doing I mean, that now. You know, there's a sense we have to understand that ways we live in the city are not permanent. And so when somebody says, what if we, what if we try putting some things here? Sounds crazy, but you know, the thing that really kickstarted the South Bronx out of that blasted rubble scape was an idea that a, a local community developer organizer named Genevieve Brooks had that she worked with Ed Loeb, the city guy on, and that was to put ranch houses in, in the South Bronx, which is the last thing anybody imagined in midst of all these empty tenements and broken buildings to put ranch houses that would have lawns and fences around them. And it was totally counterintuitive. And was it a permanent solution for the South Bronx? Absolutely not. But it was a great idea then. It got people to see different things were possible. So that's the kind of thing I think we need to have. And I think housing is a leader for that. Well, at this moment, you know, New York is opening up very rapidly yeah. with COVID. And so we have a question from Gwen Ellen Anderson. To what extent is it going to be affected by Zoom towns, people moving out of the city? We're now, we're not really asking you to speculate. I'm asking you to say, what are we seeing? What is the city looking like as it comes out of COVID? What has changed? I think that the move out for second homes for a certain kind of housing outside of the, outside of the city itself, absolutely. The markets in the suburbs are for the last year and even now are still crazy. Um, so there are certain people who are moving out of the city. That's okay. Um, it's happened before. Um, if it makes prices, you know, I don't think that the highest possible square foot residential is necessarily a goal for a city. I think that's actually a sign of a bubble. So if that number comes down a bit and lets people who otherwise couldn't come in do it, I think that's fine. I think the fact that Goldman is going to be bringing people back in to the Goldman office. Sucks the yeah, I mean, there are real signs that the business community um, is going to be coming in faster. I'm sure behind the scenes, City Hall is pushing that harder because, you know, uh, vaccination rates are, are, you know, relative to the rest of the world, pretty high. We're looking at more than 40% of New Yorkers are vaccinated fully. And I think people are ready to come back. The, the, there's an immense amount of pent up desire um, for people to use the city again. So a lot of neighborhoods are feeling close to um, where they were, but um, there's still a quiet, that's wonderful. And I think if you talk to people who are in New York now, they will say to each other a little bit, we kind of are liking it this way. <laughs> there is a certain kind of, there's been a certain restive quality. And I think there's a sense that it's going to be finite, that the city will get back to something like that. Last couple of questions. Uh, we have. I don't think, the, from, I think everyone is talking about. Yeah. Uh, Caitlin Sherman asks about the empty storefronts, right. which of course is a global issue. You know, people no longer go into the store; they buy online. online. Retail. Yep. So, how is that changing New York? You know, it's it's only gotten worse. Obviously, um, we only became more dependent on Amazon and without street traffic. It, it real estate has been really blown up. So, I, I think. For me, it's hard, to, you know, we're not going to get that all back. It's just not all going to come back. So I think it is really important that we think about some other uses for that space. Um, I know this is, you know, on the spectrum of wacky ideas like ranch houses in the South Bronx, but we've incentivized for so long in New York that landlords can um, keep storefronts empty and, 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 you know, wait for the highest thing. I think we need to incentivize them letting other people use them for other ideas that aren't necessarily simply retail. I think we need to get a lot more creative about that and let them be used for other ways to create community and action on the street. Uh, we have a question from Chantal Lawrence, who she went the other way from you, uh, from New York to Chicago for work. Yeah. Uh, you went, uh, of course, Chicago to New York. So what improvements from New York would you like to see in Chicago, especially improving communities on the south and west sides? And I think we can take that question more broadly. What can other cities learn from New York? Right. Um, the, you know, the people who I really, really loved and who I learned about in, in New York were a kind of tier of, of bureaucrats, you know, other, all these other people whose names I didn't mention, who were really passionately devoted to the city, you know, and understood the parties didn't matter to them as much as New York City. They kind of have that 
you know, that the, that the, the name of the book, New York, New York, comes from Holly White, the urbanist who was once asked. I was going to ask you that, yeah. You were going to, all right, I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to step on you for that. But they asked him once, what are your three favorite American cities? And Holly White says, New York, New York, New York. And there is, there was under Koch and it stayed all the way through and still exists a kind of cadre of people who, no matter what party they're in, believe that the highest service they have is to New York City. And there's a passion and a belief in New York as a concept. And one of the things that struck me moving from Chicago to New York was, you know, no one ever believed their aldermen really supported them in Chicago. There, there was a, an intense cynicism about politics in Chicago. And moving to New York, even in 1980, and that's never changed, my daughter now works in politics in New York, is that people really do believe in their elected officials in New York. They really expect something from them. They, they still believe in politics as the way to get things done. And which is not to say that, you know, there aren't people who do that in Chicago and there aren't people who get involved in their communities. Of course there are, but there's a kind of intensity of it that people really still believe that they can make some change on a personal level. And I mean, that's a tonic that I'd like to put in the water of every city is that you know, throwing up your hands and waiting for City Hall to make the change just is never going to get it done. Blaming it on them, whoever them are, um, doesn't get it done. It, it is a matter of, of picking up your shovel and trying to figure out what am I going to do with the land in front of me and the people around me. And um, I think New Yorkers do a great job of that. And I, I wish I saw more of that sometimes in Chicago, a little less cynicism and a more blind faith. Yeah, you talk about how it's every city dwellers drops live in their community, which I, I found very inspiring. Uh, I don't always. Last None of us do, you know, I mean, I think that's that. And I certainly don't say that I'm, you know, I've lived there for 40 years and it was years before I really felt I was a New Yorker. 40 years. So yeah, that was what I was going to ask. That was my closing question. You you got me again. <laughs> so you're a New Yorker now. That's that's I, how yeah. you describe it. I mean, but now it, I think it was a, and if I am now allowed to go to sports, um, there were two things. One was the Knicks, the the kind of the, the Patrick Ewing, New York Knicks basketball. I'm going to control this very, very tightly. Very tightly, who just were this kind of bangy, smashy, ugly team that completely expressed what it was like to live in New York then in this kind of underdog city. And when John Starks dunked on Michael Jordan on the Bulls, it was just this amazing moment. Like we were like, we was just, the city felt like an underdog then. And then the other moment that just kind of made me feel like a New Yorker was going to game three of the World Series in 2001 after just a couple of weeks after 9-11. We were weeping, everyone was weeping. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, after the game they won and um, after the game they play at Yankee Stadium, they play New York, they play Frank Sinatra singing New York, New York. And I'm not even a Sinatra fan, right? But here were 60,000 people who were still all just shattered, you know, and, and trembling after 9-11, really. And they're all singing New York, New York at the top of their lungs. And I'm just like weeping with my six-year-old son. I'm like, all right, I live here. You know, there's no, I can't pretend that I, I just, I am a New Yorker. I'm a part of this, you know? And um, it, it took a while to kind of own the place, but I think that you have to do that. And a lot of us have lived on New York without living in it in that way. I'm beginning to write a book about Paris where I've lived for nearly 20 years and I've learned a lot from reading yours. And one thing I've learned is that you have to tell the, city, the story of a city partly through sport. <laughs> you, you free reign, many pages, you should. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Tom, that was wonderful. Hang on a sec, because we have a traditional ending to Pan News sessions. I'm gonna hand over to the uh, senior provost, Pamela, who's gonna close it all off. Am I just adjunct or how's that work? You're a guest speaker, unpaid guest speaker. <laughs> Let's give him tenure. Why wouldn't we? Why are we holding back?